from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Now we're going to welcome to the stage Amy Sarah King. Hello, can you hear me out there? Fantastic. You know, I prepare for things really seriously. I've been writing for 25 years. I lecture in places and I'm really prepared. And today I thought, I'm going to wing it. The reason is, is because in a way, even though I've talked about this book in other places, I've never really figured out who the new persona is, right? Because I write young adult novels, so I usually talk to university students and high school students, and then I wrote a middle grade novel, and I have a nine-year-old at home, so I know how I talk to her, and then it turns out I talk to her the exact same way as I talk to everybody else, and I don't have to invent a persona at all. I could just be me. Um, but I'm here to talk about Mia Marvin Gardens. It's a novel that's really close to my heart. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, and then I'm going to read a tiny bit. But really, because my name is asking, I'm all about the questions. Are you guys up for some questions and answers? Great. You can talk to me about how it took me 15 years to get published, or how I write a book, or how I tap dance, any of those things. I'm open to all of those things. Um, but I just want to tell you a little bit about the book. It's it's interesting. I sat down to write the book with one thing in mind. I wanted to write a book about an animal that eats plastic and that could solve the world's plastic pollution problem. And this is interesting because I love science. I've always loved science. So when I write middle grade, I get to write about science. And I'm writing my next one now, and there's more science in that. Anyway, so I, I sat down to write about this, this animal who eats plastic. and. What actually came out of me was this 30-year-old story of, of stuff that actually happened to me. And this is, tends to happen. I, like I said, I've written more than 20 novels. This happens every time. So in this book, you'll meet Obi Devlin. He's a boy. Um, he grew up simple in nature, surrounded by 50 acres of cornfield, a bubbling creek, and a 200-year-old oak tree. And he was connected to the land through his family's history. It was his family's land at one time. Um, and he only had one best friend, had one friend, because just like me growing up in the middle of a cornfield and growing up in a rural area, you really only have one friend if you're lucky. And they used to explore the wilderness together, right? But then meet the developers who buy the wilderness and they level it and they plant house seeds and then houses grow instead of corn. And meet the new kids in Obi's new development and his best friend has to disown him in order to make friends with these new kids. And his life would really never be the same after that. He thought everything was just bummer from there on out. But then he meets Putrid Annie, who might have been named after me. I may have been called Putrid Amy once, at least. Anyway, she's a nature-loving girl, and she lives in the new development too, but she, really, she teaches Obi that new kids can be kind. And then, of course, Obi meets Marvin Gardens, a strange creature who he finds in the creek one night, munching on a plastic water bottle. So like I said, like Obi, I grew up in the middle of that same cornfield, near that same 200-year-old oak tree. And like Obi, I heard stories about how that land was our family's land, until my grandfather, who was an alcoholic, drank 175 acres of it and left our family with nothing. Like Obi, I struggled with new kids, suburban kids who had no interest in crayfish or dirt. Um, except my, in my case, my best friend didn't defect to the other side. She just moved to Connecticut. Um, but that was the same summer that the bulldozers came and woke me up every morning with that beep, 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 beeping that they do when they back up. The only thing Obi and I don't have in common is the plastic eating animal. Now, I was a farmer in Ireland. I lived in Ireland for 15 years. I was a self-sufficient farmer. And if you want to know about what that means, ask me, what does that really mean? But I'll tell you now, it means I didn't buy anything for 10 years, not one thing. Oh, well, give me a second. Give me like five more minutes, all right? I promise, you'll be the first one I call on. Um, so, um, so I was on this farm in Ireland, um, and I had goats. And the goats kind of were the closest thing to, to um, to Marvin Gardens, but honestly, they'll eat anything. Um, but 
when I started researching for this book, it was kind of interesting because, I mean, like, this animal only eats plastic, okay, Marvin? That's all he eats. Only plastic, like, for real. So, some of the research I did for this book really bummed me out, you guys. It really bummed me out. And, and I'm sorry to do this to you right after lunch, but I'm just going to throw out a few things that I learned. Um, so here's two. It takes a plastic bottle 500 years to decompose. Americans throw away 2.5 million of these bottles per hour. More than 1 million plastic bags are used every minute. About 80% of the trash in our landfills could be recycled. And then I want to talk to you as well, just for kicks, I don't know. Have you guys ever heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Yeah, you've heard of it? Okay, some of you might know about it, some of you might not know about it. I always saw it, and, and a lot of times when, when we look at the articles about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, we see like plastic bottles and plastic bags floating, and we've heard it's the size of Texas, and then we've heard this, it's the size of the continental United States. In actual fact, it could be either, depending on the day, the size changes quite often. But the Great um, Pacific Garbage Patch is, um, is actually not plastic things floating. It's not just the way we imagine garbage. Some of you may know this, but the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is an area in the Pacific Gyre, which is the middle of the Pacific, okay, where the water has become so polluted with microplastics, that means like tiny plastics, all right, that it almost looks like gel. Now think of this size of Texas, size of the continental United States, and it almost looks like gel, or actually Obi in the book refers to it as confetti gel, because there are so many trillions of pieces of tiny little microplastics in this water. Um, actually, just to bum you out a little more after lunch, sorry, um, there are two major garbage patches in the Pacific and one of the Atlantic. We just don't talk about that one very much. So before writing this book, I recycled casually. Now I recycle like a maniac. I was the one upstairs putting my Fritos in the one place and the bag in the other. That's me. Um, but I also started calling my best friend who moved to Connecticut more often. And it also made me rescue a kitten. Okay, because when I left the farm in Ireland, that would be 13 years ago, I left it all behind. I loved that farm. I built it with my two hands. Well, actually, my husband and I built it with our four hands. I should give him some credit. Uh, but I had had animals. I went from walking around with chickens on my shoulders and, and having goats and chasing horses that got loose. And I came back to America, and I decided no pets, no animals. That's it. I became this, like, cold, petless person. And then I, I adopted this kitten, and her name is Ziggy Jack. And she's brought me back to the person that I was when I was actually Obi's age. Because though I was severely allergic to cats at that age, all I wanted was a kitten. And now I'm not severely allergic anymore, and now I've got a kitten. So basically, if you know me and you're here, if you know me from my other work, if you know me from any place you've ever seen me speak, if you read me in Marvin Gardens, you're going to see a little bit of me in it, because really it's my family's life. Um, I, was I was thrilled to be able to explore what was going on 100 years ago, when my grandfather was losing our, our land. Um, but it would be Obi's great-grandfather. I'm going to read a tiny piece of the book and check my time. Um, and then I'm just going to go for questions and answers because you guys look really curious. Um, and I mean that in the nice way. I'm going to read you just a little piece of when, of how Obi and, and Annie, his friend Annie on the bus, um, and how they interact with each other. Um, and so, let's see, you need to know, all right, Obi lives in the farm, they're starting to build these houses, Annie lives in the development as well, so she's on the same bus route as him. And um, if I've forgotten anything else, I'll just throw it in while I'm reading, that's just how I roll today. Um, so, okay, and Mike, um, Mike was his, uh, is, sorry, Tommy is his old best friend, and Tommy's new best friend is Mike, he's kind of mean. Um, because mean people exist. I still don't understand that. Just want to let you know. I don't know how mean people exist, but they do. All right. We had seating assignments on the bus. Six months ago, Tommy switched to sit with his new friend, Mike. And the bus driver told him that it was the only switch he'd get. In the switch, I got to sit next to Annie Bell, who the boys called Putrid Annie, because she threw up in school once. Annie was in the fifth grade and moved here from Portland, Oregon, right before winter break. She lived in phase one of the development. 
I liked her because she was the one kid on the bus who wasn't trying to prove something to anyone. She said the boys who called her putrid Annie were just dumb and weak because they couldn't think for themselves. And that was probably true. The only thing I really knew about Mike, Tommy's new best friend, was that he'd accidentally shot his younger brother in the foot with a BB gun when he was little. His little brother still had the BB in his foot. I'd seen it. Other than that, Mike didn't seem to have much of a personality. He didn't have hobbies. He didn't get good grades. He didn't care about much. Annie cared about pretty much everything. She loved two things especially, rocks and water. Sorry, I mean weather. I don't know what's wrong with these glasses. It's not me, it's the glasses. Rocks and weather. She wanted to be a geologist or a meteorologist. Whenever she found a rock, she'd talk about how old it might be. She told me all about the geolo geologic time scale, which was like pretending the earth was a cake with layers, and some layers were older than other layers. She also believed the weather in Portland, Oregon, was superior to the weather in Reading, Pennsylvania. So we'd argue about that sometimes, but never really argue, argue. Annie played the cello. I also played the cello. So I get to be Obi and Annie in this book. It's kind of weird. Anyway, Annie played the cello. So on orchestra days, she'd have to fit both herself and her cello into our seat. Because of how big the cello was, she had to squeeze in close to me and put the cello in the aisle seat. I didn't mind. There was nothing putrid about Annie. What's wrong with you, she asked when she got on th that morning. What? You look happy or something. I can't be happy? Not on a Tuesday, no. She said, you're supposed to be mopey and kind of annoyed. I laughed. Oh my gosh, you're laughing now? That's worrying. Stop it or I'll laugh more, I said. I'll be you then, look, mopey, annoyed. She held her face in this frozen look of pain. Is that what it was like to be my friend? To have to look, like, look at that all the time? The bus was worse than anywhere else, I knew that. Tommy and his new friends were there. Maybe I was happier off the bus, I, I couldn't tell. It's hard to see yourself when you are yourself, I guess. Annie still had that look on her face, like she was trying hard to look mean or something. You can stop now, I said, good. She smiled. It's tiring being you. I reached into my pocket and found the tiny rock I'd picked up at the creek. I gave it to her. Ooh, quartzite, she said. Good job, rockhound. I smiled. I'm going to leave it at that because you guys look curious. But um, I'm not telling you the spoilers in this book. There is a mystery animal and there is a secret that Marvin Gardens has. He's not all great and it, it, eating plastic bottles does have its side effects. That's all I'm going to say. Um, but... Uh, if anything, if I can make, I don't know, if I can make us all think a little bit more about pollution and what we do with our trash and what we do when we walk by trash on the street, um, then I feel like I've done my job. So I'm going to go to questions and answers now. And I already promised somebody he'd be the first one. Hold it. Where were you? Is that you? Yes. You're going to have to really yell. You like science too? All right. I love science. Yes. Oh, I didn't hear you. What? You love nature? What, what's your favorite part of nature? Trees, birds, what? Having fun with it. Awesome. Excellent. Nature is awesome. There's no doubt about it. I'm coming over there in a second. Yes. Am I going to write a sequel? I'm not. I am not a sequel writer. Um, I have about nine, uh, eight or nine published novels, and none of them are, are... They're connected, funnily enough. A lot of times they're set in the same place. So the next one is set in a similar place, but they, they're not connected, no. Um, yes. Am I going to publish another book? I'm, I'm going to publish books till I die, if, if they let me. That's, that's pretty much my whole point. I hear you back there, Mary. Uh, can't miss that laugh. Uh, you're awesome. Um, yeah, until, until I'm, I'm, I'm toast, I'm going to publish books, because I'm here to ask questions and help you ask questions. What else do you have? You've got to have something for me. Yeah. What is the plastic at eating creature called? He's named Marvin Gardens, and you won't believe it, but he has a wife, and her name is Boardwalk. Do any of you ever play, I know, did you, have you ever played Monopoly? A lot, there's a lot of Monopoly fun in this book, um, and not so much fun too, because their dad plays with them, and he always wins, just like my dad. 
Actually, I'm 47 years old, and last month I beat my father in ping pong for the first time, and I gloated, and I strutted around the place because he never let me win as a child, and then he wanted a rematch, and I said no. It was awesome. Somebody had their hand up over that direction, but I don't know who it was. All right. Yes. What's my favorite thing to what? Oh, what was my favorite thing to do on the farm? Wow, that's a great question. I really love breeding chickens. Here's a weird story for you. This, is, this, will, this will be weird, already. So since I was self-sufficient, I didn't make any money, okay? I grew my own food. I grew my own whatever I was eating, whether it was, uh, sorry for the vegetarians in the room, whether it was a chicken, um, or whether I could trade some things for half of another sort of animal, um, or whether it was vegetables, I grew everything myself. So I didn't have any money. So all this time I was writing, right? So I finally got a computer, I built one, actually, um, and um, I mean, I built one out of components, so I didn't make the components, because that'd be crazy. Um, but I built this computer, and I was writing novels on the computer, because I started on a typewriter, right? And the only way I could send my books out and the letters out to go, like, to publishers was I had to hatch chickens or ducks. And I, I bred rare poultry, so I got some decent money. Like, per chicken, I'd maybe get 20, 20 euros per chicken. Um, but I'd have to wait 21 weeks. So if I thought about, okay, I finished this novel, I'd have to think about how many different agents or publishers I wanted to query and then hatch so many chickens to cover the postage and the photocopying and all that stuff in order to send. So the long, the long answer was that one. The short answer is chickens. My favorite thing was chickens. I loved my chickens. I had some epic chickens. Yes, sir. What does Marvin Gardens look like? Well, you see, I can't tell you because it's a secret. But I can tell you he's kind of slimy, and when you pet him, it kind of feels like snot. That's all I can tell you. Because he's an animal that's never been discovered before. So he's kind of like a hog and kind of like a dog and kind of like a mix. The whole point of that part of the book is your imagination. Yeah. But he is slimy, so that's kind of like algae. Yeah. What? I used to name my chickens till I started to eat my chickens, and then I realized it was really a bad idea to name your chickens. Um, so I, I do remember one named Edna very fondly. She was a lovely chicken, but after that, no. No, I didn't name my goats either. I'm scanning. What else you got? Yes. Is your hand up? Yeah? question. How long did it take me to write? This book took me probably about, probably a year to write. Sometimes it depends on the book, you know. Sometimes it takes me 10 years to write a book. Sometimes it takes me a few months, but it, everything has to do with rewriting. So I can write the book down, but I have to keep writing it and writing it to make it better and better and better, you know, make things match. So about a year. Yeah. Have I ever had to do page one rewrite? Every day of my life, all the time. Yeah, rewriting's my favorite thing. Revision is everything. I always say revision is the sport. Because it is, it's like the thing you train for. You get that first draft down and then you realize some of the stuff doesn't make sense and then you have to connect it, you know? But is, is page one rewrite like a, a specific thing? Oh yeah, I start over all the time, you bet. Absolutely. Although, in fairness, in th this page started similarly to how I did it in the first draft, but it got better. Yeah. Which book do I like the best that I've written? That's... Hmm. It's the weirdest book I ever wrote, and it's actually for an older audience. It's for uh, older teenagers and for adults. It's called I Crawl Through It. Um, and... Uh, it's a very strange book. It's, I think it's one of the only surrealist, like what they call pure surrealism um, for teenagers. Um, I tend to be a bit surreal anyway, so yes. What's the best writing advice you ever got from an elementary school teacher? 
from an elementary school teacher, best writing advice. Hmm. I had two of them that used to hit me on the hand because I didn't hold my pencil right, so I'm not, I'm not going to give them any credit. Um, on, can, I, can I make, well, I think librarians are teachers too. So actually the best writing advice I ever got was from a li my, my elementary school librarian where when I, any question I asked her, um, it was uh, Max in The Wild Things. And I said, does he really go? Does he really go to the land of the wild things? And she said, I don't know, Amy, what do you think? And I feel that my entire career is owed to her. Her name is Dawn Moan. We're now Facebook friends. And so I get to write to her every now and again and thank her. But honestly, making me think for myself, making me answer questions instead of telling me what the book was about, asking me what I thought it was about was probably the smartest thing any educator ever did for me. Oh, hey, educators in the room. Rock on. <laughs> it's a true story. All right. Uh, yes. Did I write the wild things? I wish. No. No, Maurice Sendak wrote The Wild Things. It's such a good book, isn't it? Is he my friend? No, sadly. I'd like him to be my friend, but that'll have to happen at a later date. to be a writer. Honestly, when it comes to young kids, because I have, I have this nine-year-old who was once a seven-year-old, and she has, she wouldn't tell you because her mom's a writer, so she doesn't want to be a writer. But she has it, she has it. And the two things that, that, that I would recommend is reading, a lot of reading, um, and a lot of writing. Um, and using, and going, using your imagination completely. Like my daughter once said to me, she said, well, I don't think I'm allowed to draw the pictures in my book. And I said, well, why would you think that? Of course you can draw the pictures in your book. Um, and so she came back to me with this picture book about unicorns and, and you know, but um, the other thing is that, and it's hard sometimes depending on the age group and what age you are, but I think a writer needs to be able to spend time by themselves and not be bored and not always have to. And that's the one thing I found with my daughter. So if, if you're bored and it's summer vacation still, which I don't think it is down here anymore, but if you're bored next summer vacation, instead of going, oh, I'm bored, sit down with some, some paper and see what you can come up with. And don't try and plan everything out. Is that, is that the second grader there? Is that her? Okay, maybe. All right. Don't try and plan everything out. Just sit down and go. Have fun. Have fun. It takes a while, so why not have fun while you're doing it? So that's, that's the best I can do. I've only got about three minutes, so only a few more burning questions, if you have any. Yes, sir. Um, do I think the plastic problem could be solved? It's pretty big. And we have so many different types of cultures in our world, right? We have so many different places. Not, I can't do anything about what other countries do. Um, I think the earth will probably solve it one way or the other, but I think that it'll actually really harm us. I mean, it's the same as what we're seeing with climate change now. Um, it is real, um, and I'll fist fight you for that. Uh, not you personally, but anybody who wants to say it's not. Um, but the idea that it's costing us so much money and costing lives and all these things, and plastics, plastic pollution is doing the same thing, usually actually in countries that we don't talk about much. So Southeast Asia, um, it's, it's really causing a huge amount of, of um, problems in the actual population. So I don't know. I don't know, can it be solved? I'd like to think it can be. I think the fir we have to start at the source. What are we going to do with this bottle today? We're going to recycle it, right? We're going to recycle it, right? And if we can't recycle it, we'll bring it home and recycle it. Or we'll say to the teacher at school, do you have a recycling bin? Yes? Sound good? That's what I do when I go to schools. They look at me like I'm crazy, but I'm used to that. So, yeah. Yeah. 
I know. It's weird. I mean, it's funny. There's a part of the book where, where the Obi turns around to his father and he says, plastic's ruined everything. And he goes, oh, really? Plastic's ruined everything. And then he opens up the fridge and he says, look at this. Your milk, your yogurt, your cheese, your meat. And he just starts listing everything. Ketchup, your, your chocolate syrup, your, this syrup, your all these. Everything's in plastic. So it's not doing you. And look at the whole fridge. It's plastic. You know, it's not hurting you. And so I think that's one of those things that we have that sort of, we have that blinker vision on, you know? But, um, yeah, it's, it's annoying. I mean, I'd like to see, as someone who goes to a lot of schools um, throughout the year, I would really like to see more recycling bins in schools. And because I know kids want to. It's not just me. Kids learn those things, and they're like, hey, what's up with this? There's no recycling. So, yeah, I mean, most of our, our convenient lunch foods now, our pre-made, our processed stuff is in plastic. All right, we have to wrap it up. One more question. I did purposely go with my full name um, because my, my father used to say, why aren't you using my name anymore? And that's, that's a joke. Um, it was really just because, yeah, I purposely did that. And it was, it was invigorating. It was totally different. And I love working with a different age group. I still connect most with with teenagers and, and, but that's not even true. I, I still, I like connecting with nine year olds. I like connecting with eight year olds. So um, yeah, so far so good. It's been really quite cool. Um, that's why I'm writing another one because it's been interesting, but I'm writing young adult and adult at the same time too. So thank you so much for all your great questions and for listening today. Don't forget to recycle your bottles. All right, promise. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.